Lucky for Hollywood, a decent music biopic is practically guaranteed to be a smash hit at the box office. Unfortunately, Hollywood isn't actually very good at making them, and it definitely doesn't help that so many of them play so fast and loose with the truth. Here are a few of the times that music biopics have lied about what really happened. The story of Freddie Mercury was so extraordinary and dramatic that it almost seemed perfect for a big screen adaptation. Freddie, we're a family. No, we're not! We're not a family! You've got families, children, wives, what have I got? And that's why it was such a shame that Bohemian Rhapsody wasn't Freddie Mercury's real-life story, but just fantasy instead. Despite what Bohemian Rhapsody told you, Freddie Mercury didn't introduce himself to Brian May and Roger Taylor after the gig in which Smile lead singer Tim Stoffel quit. In fact, he already knew all three of them and they were even roommates for a short amount of time. The movie would also lead you to believe that John Deacon was their original bassist, although they went through three other men between the band's founding and Deacon's first show in July 1971. And then there's the treatment of Paul Printer, Mercury's former manager. Although he's rightfully portrayed as the villain in the story, Bohemian Rhapsody got many of the details surrounding his firing wrong. For starters, the film says he was fired prior to the Live Aid concert in 1985 and that he went on television to out Mercury in retaliation. However, the truth is that Printer was fired in 1987 after he sold his story about Mercury to the Sun, a notorious British tabloid. Seen as how Motley Crue made a whole career out of being unapologetically excessive, it may seem strange to play with the truth for the dirt, the film version of their notorious 2001 memoir. But strangely enough, the cinematic take on the dirt gave short shrift to those times when either Vince Neil or Tommy Lee weren't in the band. And while it makes sense for the film to focus on the lineup with whom they made their biggest hits, the firing of former manager Doc McGee depicted in the movie doesn't jibe with the official story. In the movie, Nikki Six gets upset when McGee tries to reunite Six with his estranged mother. But in reality, the firing happened after McGee slotted them below headliners Bon Jovi at the Moscow Music Peace Festival. Upon learning that they were to be Bon Jovi's opening act, Lee wrote in the dirt that he hunted Doc down and found him backstage. I walked right up to him and pushed him in his fat little chest, knocking him over onto the ground like a broken weeble. The Buddy Holly story received uniformly strong reviews on its release in 1978, except from those closest to Holly. Shortly after the film hit theaters, Chet Flippo of Rolling Stone spoke with some of those who were slighted. Because Jerry Allison and Joe B. Malden, two of the other members of the Crickets, had sold their rights to another studio, their names were changed in the film to Jerry Charles and Joe Bob Simmons. Norman Petty, who produced the bulk of Holly's classic recordings, was also left out of the story entirely. And neither Holly's mother nor his brother were happy with the way his family life was portrayed, claiming the filmmakers went back on their word to consult with them. In response to the film's claim that she and her husband pushed Buddy to quit rock and roll, Ella Holly said, We were behind Buddy 100%. We were very anxious for him to make a career as a singer. We were his biggest fans. Buddy's brother Larry added, It didn't portray his life at all, really. They didn't ask us about a thing. I didn't feel that was my brother up there on the screen. We weren't happy with the movie at all. Jonathan Herman and Andrea Burloff received an Oscar nomination for their screenplay about the formation of NWA, but Straight Outta Compton earned just as many headlines for what they left out of it. Some of the film's omissions are fairly minor, such as the fact that Dr. Dre was arrested for unpaid parking tickets rather than for defending his brother, or the lack of mention of the contributions of founding member Arabian Prince. Perhaps more importantly, however, Straight Outta Compton completely omits Dre's early history of violence against women, particularly high-profile incidents involving his girlfriend Michelle A and hip-hop television host Dee Barnes, who wrote a lengthy Gawker article about it in 2015. They grabbed me by my hair and started slamming me up against the wall. Barnes wrote that she didn't necessarily want to relive the experience on screen, but that she did want some acknowledgement that it was part of his character. She wrote, In his lyrics, Dre made hyperbolic claims about all these heinous things he did to women, but then he went out and actually violated women. Straight Outta Compton would have you believe that he didn't really do that. That's what they're trying to do with Straight Outta Compton. They're trying to stay hard and look like good guys. Jamie Foxx earned an Academy Award for his portrayal of Ray Charles in Ray, Taylor Hackford's 2004 smash hit biopic about Ray Charles. But a week before it was released, David Ritz, the co-author of Charles' autobiography, wrote an article for Slate discrediting the film for its portrayal of the music legend's life. Although he praised Fox in the film's key supporting players, he said that Ray was a quote, saccharine movie that trivializes the compelling complexity of Ray Charles' character. 
Ritz said the film left out the importance of one of his father's ex-wives, Mary Jane, who indulged him where his actual mother, Aretha, instilled in him the need for self-reliance. The writer also took exception to how the film downplayed the jazz side of Charles's music in favor of his soul hits and reduced many of the important people in his life to one-dimensional stereotypes. According to Ritz, the movie ends with the implication that Charles lived in a happy marriage with Della and never used drugs again, but in reality they divorced in 1976 and Charles continued to drink and smoke marijuana until his death. Like Ray, the Johnny Cash biopic Walk the Line was also a popular award-winning movie about an American music icon that focused largely on his drug use and how he was redeemed by the love of a good woman. But Kathy Cash, daughter of the American music legend to one of his other wives, didn't like how her mother was depicted in Walk the Line. She told the Tennessean, My mom was basically a non-entity in the entire film except for the mad little psycho who hated his career. That's not true. She loved his career and was proud of him until he started taking drugs and stopped coming home. Another of Cash's daughters, Roseanne, broadened the scope of criticism against Walk the Line, arguing that the film reduced his complicated life to a bland love triangle. She told The Guardian the movie was painful. The three of them in the film were not recognizable to me as my parents in any way. It's a Hollywood movie, very complex lives reduced to two hours, so how can it possibly show the depths of truth? Gloria Sages Monday's 2010 movie about the Runaways was based on singer Cherie Curry's 1989 biography Neon Angel. Curry told the AV Club that she was mostly happy with the movie and especially Dakota Fanny's portrayal of her, but admitted that Sages Monday took license with some of the band's history. Notably, she said the depiction of manager Kim Fowley, whose behavior Curry alleged to be abusive, was toned down for the Runaways. She said, My book is the real story. This is just a lighter kind of flash of what the Runaways were for a specific amount of time. How do you possibly take two and a half years and make it a film that's an hour and a half and make it even closely touch what was truly going on? Speaking to the Los Angeles Times, Fowley himself didn't dispute anything specific that took place in the film's plot, but agreed it was Curry's side of the story with Sages Monday's perspective added. He said, Every movie needs a villain, and I'm a good one. The issue is whether or not this is a good movie, and the answer is yes. This is not a historical document. It took 43 years from his death in 1970 for a Jimi Hendrix biopic to finally be made. And even then, Hendrix's former girlfriend Kathy Etchingham wrote a lengthy post on her website denying some of the accounts shown in the film. 2013's Jimmy All Is By My Side starred Andre 3000 as the guitar legend and dealt with the period between his arrival in England in 1966 and his guitar-burning U.S. breakthrough at the Monterey Pop Festival a year later. Most importantly, she revealed that a scene in which Hendrix beat her with a telephone never actually happened, and that when she complained that it was fictional, the filmmakers told her that they had heard from a different source that it was true. She also criticized how the love triangle between herself, Hendrix, and Linda Keith was portrayed. She also lambasted the accuracy of the costumes and even the music, since Hendrix's estate wouldn't authorize its use in the movie, and they had to rely on a trio of studio pros to recreate it. Etchingham also disliked the film's characterization of Hendrix. She wrote, The biggest disappointment of this film was that after expecting at least some kind of depiction of Jimmy's humor and creativity, and the amusing and creative times that were happening in London, Instead, we were shown a gloomy and depressing dark tale that pictured Jimmy as some sort of moronic, mumbling mystic. Speaking to the LA Times in 1991, Doors keyboardist Ray Manzarek spoke out about Oliver Stone's biopic about his band. Although he admitted that Val Kilmer managed a nice attempt at playing Jim Morrison and liked the recreation of their concerts, he told the paper that he walked out of the film, having mostly become upset at Stone's interpretation of Morrison. Manzarek said, All you see is Jim as a drunken hedonist. The tragedy is that fame consumed him. But that wasn't Jim's message. He was intelligent. He was loving. He was a good man who believed in freedom and in questioning authority. But you'd never know that from seeing this film. CBGB wasn't really a biopic, but rather a movie about the famed New York club that was at the heart of the birth of punk rock, but it still wound up being widely panned for its mistakes. You're not telling me the whole story. It's not supposed to be. The Village Voice, which chronicled the rise of New York punk in its pages back in the mid-70s, was all too happy to point out where the film went wrong. In addition to bemoaning the lack of people of color, even though plenty of bands that played the club had black members, they noted that the club's walls were shown littered with band stickers even before it had opened, and that Patti Smith is shown singing her hit Because the Night long before it had been written by her and Bruce Springsteen. 
In their piece on the film, Village Voice wrote, The whole thing has about as much punk credibility as an off-the-rack $30 Ramones t-shirt from Hot Topic. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.